Hello and welcome to another rousing edition of Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Scott, I'm ready for some podcasting. Is this like a new thing you're taking away from the Bond section where you're going to sing every episode now i hope so i hope so i'd like to bring my tone deaf stylings to the world well i think most of the listeners have already left at this point so that's fine that's fair that's fair i totally understand well i'm genuinely curious about this one cam what are we talking about this week we are talking about 1934's the man who knew too much directed by alfred hitchcock now i need to know because i think this was a you choice did you pick this film because you think it's named about you Oh, um, yes, that's exactly why. I mean, you are a self-professed super genius. Yes, that's also true. So, yeah, and there's two of them, so of course you would pick them. (laughs) Double the fun. (laughs) Well, Cam, I'll make this easy. I haven't ever seen this film or the, uh, the remake, so that's my entire backstory with it. What about you? Yeah, I saw this one many years ago. Um, I'd started purchasing Alfred Hitchcock box sets on DVD. So I got kind of like the really good ones, you know, the big studio produced ones with movies like Psycho and The Birds and all the classics. And then I bought a collection of Hitchcock movies, like the ones that are tougher to find, that was put out by some shady organization that had gotten the, uh, well, probably these movies were open to copyright. So they just kind of threw them on a disc in very poorly um, mastered copies. And so this was one of the movies on that DVD set, and I remember watching it and enjoying the movie, but struggling to understand the dialogue through the entire course of that um, very wobbly DVD experience. Put a pin in that, because I want to come back to that dialogue issue Yeah, uh, a, a little later on. But uh, let's hop into the letterbox.com synopsis, as I know everyone's chomping at the bit to hear me try and talk my way through this one. The man, or the cam... Who knew too much? (laughs) Public enemy number one of all the world. While vacationing in Saint-Marie, a British couple receive a clue to an imminent assassination attempt, only to learn that their young daughter has been kidnapped to keep them quiet. I like that one. That pretty much sums it up. Yeah, that doesn't give you much, but it gives you something. Now, well, it seems like what you would say if you were pitching the movie to a studio like it seems very basic yeah but it's provocative yeah yeah um the tagline though like the catchphrase for the movie is a little questionable though i get i I can kind of see the point based on the plot though i guess but it's like who's it referring to i think the assassin is it i don't know Well, the guy uh, they make mention of archduke franz ferdinand And this is meant to be kind of a copy of that situation. So the assassin who killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand started World War I. Yeah. And cost millions and millions of lives on the planet Earth. So you could argue this guy is public enemy number one. I stand by it. I guess, but he's not the primary villain of the movie. Oh, no. So I don't know. No. There's a puppet master. Fair enough. I think it's okay, Cam. But I'm curious. How did Alfred Hitchcock get to St. Marie? Well, um, this movie fell at an interesting time for Hitchcock. So he burst onto the scene in 1925 with a movie called The Pleasure Garden and had made several films of varying quality. You've got some really good ones like The Lodger, but there was a lot of stuff that was clunky. And he had a string of duds. He had a few movies like um, The Number 17, which is probably his worst movie, as well as Strauss's Great Waltz, also known as Waltzes from Vienna, which was a sort of romantic comedy biopic about Strauss, the composer. Um, And so, like, he, the Hitchcock we know so well was not solidified yet. He was kind of bouncing among projects that really didn't suit him. And he ultimately wound up moving into this movie. This was the project he ended up moving on to from Waltz's. And he teamed up with uh, Charles Bennett. And he'd had a relationship with Bennett for a while. One of his first movies was a movie called Blackmail. And it was based on a Charles Bennett play. And then Charles Bennett was also working in film and be- would become a long, uh, long working writer. So him and Hitchcock started kicking around ideas 
they wanted to adapt some of the old Bulldog Drummond stories for a film. And somewhere along the line, as so many projects go, it morphed into a completely different film and a different concept. And it was based on an idea Hitchcock had had on his honeymoon in St. Moritz eight years earlier. So really the whole Bulldog Drummond thing just kind of fell by the wayside. And he obviously had a very good relationship with Bennett. It seems like it was a very you know flourishing, creative sort of back and forth because they would work together on several movies, including 39 Steps, Secret Agent, Sabotage, Young and Innocent, and Foreign Correspondent. So like this was really early on in their creative partnership. But this is still uh, Hitchcock, I guess, finding his feet. Oh, yeah. He's like really all over the place at this point in his career. Is is he at least known at this point? Like, is he a name people throw? He's not Spielberg, if we're using a, an analogy for today, but he's like a, well, you know, directors better than I do. But is he like, is he in the discussion if someone's talking about directors or is he so far on the fringe people don't know who he is? He would have been known because of a movie like The Lodger, which really was a bit of a sensation. And Blackmail was a hit as well. But it's more like, like I'm trying to think of like a comparison, but it's like someone who's shown early promise, but is also proving a bit wobbly in recent years. He's only been around nine years at this point. So like his last, you know, two or three movies have been duds. And it's like, well, is he done? Or is like this guy going to figure out who he is and what he can do going forward? So um, they brought in another writer, D.B. Wyndham Lewis. This was only his fourth uh, work. And um, this guy is actually interesting. He only worked for like six years. Um, and uh, I really don't know why. Sounds I perfect. Really fine That's what I want to do. Yeah. He worked from 33 to 39. And he died like in 1969. So it's not like not so perfect. You know, there was a fatality. Not so perfect. But there was like, a, you know, I thought maybe there was an early fatality or something. Nope. Nope. But um they started kicking around, you know, basically this concept between the two writers. And they brought in a few other writers, um, scenario writers, Edwin Greenwood and A.R. Rollinson, as well as they brought in Emlyn Williams, who was a uh, additional dialogue writer. So they basically had five people just kind of molding this thing into what would become The Man Who Knew Too Much. And um, when they went to cast it, they ended up bringing in Peter Lorre. Now, Peter Lorre had made a big splash in Fritz Lang's 1931 movie, M. Uh, did Peter Lorre speak English? That was a little unknown at this point, but like he was something of a sensation because of that role. And he had left Germany shortly after the release of M um, because of, obviously, the rise of Nazism. Peter Lorre had grabbed the attention of Hitchcock's man who knew too much, um, associate producer Ivor Montagu, and he said, we wanted him at once. And this was, um, as I said, Peter Lorre's first English-speaking part. There's, like, various versions. Like, some say he was fine with English, and others say he had to learn all his lines phonetically. Who knows what the truth actually is, but um, it, I'm sure it was a bit of a transition for him. And also, Peter Lorre was dealing with morphine addiction at the time. Who isn't? So, like, there was a lot of health issues. <laughs> Who isn't these days, right? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Slap it in me. Yeah, and so he had to uh, spend one month in a sanitarium during the shooting of this movie just to deal with his health issues. Now, Peter Lorre went on to like live a long life, so he was okay, but obviously a rough period for this guy. Well, my only experience of uh, sanitariums and sort of health spas in those days is James Bond, and he seems to be having a ball, so great. He's running around trolling, um, you know, uh, Guy Dolman. Yeah, uh, locking Major time. Dolby in a sauna and uh, all kinds of things. <laughs> Was Peter Lorre, like, trolling people at the sanitarium? <laughs> as long as he wasn't manhandling the nurses and uh, playing with mink <laughs> gloves. How do you like the feel of this mink glove? Oh, Cam, <laughs> stop seducing me. Uh, so, a couple other notes just on the production. The shootout in the movie, which I'm sure we'll talk about in depth, was based on the Sydney Street Siege of 1911. Now, do you know anything about this, Scott, being a Londoner? I actually read this as part of my research and Sydney Street itself jumped out to me. I'm pretty sure I've been there, but I don't know anything about the shootout particularly. But firearms were far more prevalent around the 20s, 30s and 40s in London, to be fair. Yeah, so it seems like it was a six hour clash between the police and army against two Latvian revolutionaries. And it fell kind of at the end of an ongoing series of clashes with these Latvian revolutionaries. Um... I think it had kicked off with like a jewel heist or something like that or an attempted jewel heist. And uh, yeah, like um, 
sounds pretty intense. Six hours? That's that's something. And there was like quite a few casualties as well. Well, it wouldn't surprise me that there was a shootout around that area. It's, it's, it's very much like a suburban place. It's in Chelsea, which is, I mean, now you couldn't afford a house there unless you're a billionaire from Qatar. But back in those days, it was kind of a place where people just lived in Chelsea and they tend to work further in. So that makes sense. It seems kind of crazy to me that the army's involved as well. No, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, army bases, there's quite a few around London. It was probably more just a case of the police just asked for help and the army came along. Okay, interesting. So the name of this movie was taken from a book by G. Key Chesterton, who um, had in 1922 published a book called The Man Who Knew Too Much. Um, and it was just basically a series of detective stories and they just ripped off the title. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's just a title. <laughs> just the title. Okay. All right, fine. Sorry, GK. <laughs> hey, we can celebrate the 100-year anniversary of his book. Can we? Yeah, 1922. It's 2022. Sure. <laughs> you go right ahead, buddy. <laughs> okay. Put that next this to your movie... copy of Little Drama Girl. <laughs> so this movie had a budget of £40,000. Now, what is that roughly equivalent in American dollars, Scott? I mean, at the time or now? Uh, at the time, <laughs> you clearly would know such a thing. <laughs> let, me, let me pull out my abacus and figure that out. <laughs> no, but what about now? Like, what's forty thousand pounds nowadays? Forty thousand pounds is probably about fifty thousand dollars American. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, but then don't you usually double it to from pounds to Canadian dollars? Uh, it's maybe like eighty percent or something. It's not fully double. Okay, so like seventy thousand then. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, in those days, I'm sure that was quite a, quite a lot, really. Oh, I would imagine so. But the movie was an enormous hit. I couldn't find exact box office for 1934. Surprise, surprise. But they said it was like an enormous hit over in Britain as well as in the US. So it definitely, I think, got Hitchcock a lot more noticed outside of Britain and not so much solidified who he could be, but at least was like a... Don't worry, this guy's not going to disappear into kind of these weird projects that no one really likes. This was a genuine across-the-board mainstream hit. Well, I'm sure people were going back for second and third viewings to try and figure out what the dialogue was. <laughs> um, and Hitchcock would follow this movie up with The 39 Steps and Secret Agent. So, like, clearly this movie was like, a, oh, people like this? I will make more like this. Kind of like after The Sixth Sense, uh, M. Night Shyamalan was like, okay, more supernatural mystery films. Here you go. You want twists? Here's people getting old on a beach. That's right. Weird movie, but I kind of liked old, actually. It, it was interesting. It was uh, better than some of his other recent contributions. Like, um, well, Split was really fun, but then the follow-up to that was awful. Uh, I didn't mind Glass. I think Shyamalan is sure? just so hit or miss. I, but It's like barely yeah. anything to do with the people it's supposed to be about. I mean, I thought Glass was interesting and that it did not give you at all what you would expect. But like with him, after movies like The Last Airbender and Happening, I'm a lot kinder to stuff like Old and Glass. Don't give me the old Rian Johnson, like, subvert their expectations shtick. Last Jedi was interesting, but it was not like a complex film that he thought it was. It's fantastic. How dare you? Shut up, Cam. <laughs> so the top three... You don't, for... know, you don't know too much at all, apparently. <laughs> so the top three for 1934, number one was It Happened One Night, the like hugely popular Clark Gable, Claudette, Colbert film that swept the Oscars that year. Number two was Cleopatra, starring Claudette Colbert. She had a fantastic year. This one, I don't know if people really remember this Cleopatra. They tend to think of the Elizabeth Taylor version. But the uh, Colbert version is... Like, really fun and campy and short. <laughs> it's not four hours long like the Elizabeth Taylor one. <laughs> well, campy and short is something I'm all about. Exactly. And number three was One Night of Love, which I'd never heard of. It's a romantic drama about an opera singer played by Grace Moore. And I'm not particularly familiar with Grace Moore, so... Um... Or One Night of Love. <laughs> you know, that either. <laughs> So, Scott, you and I can maybe tackle One Night of Love on the Patreon. <laughs> That's for the special bonus tier. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. We have to pay them. <laughs> cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. So, a couple other notes. The National Board of Review 
named this movie one of the 10 best foreign films of 1934. And Hitchcock, later down the road, um, did an um, ongoing series of conversations with the director, Francois Truffaut, and it was published into a book that's like invaluable if you just want to track Hitchcock's entire career. But he had this to say about the man who knew too much, because um, Truffaut asked him about what he thought about the original version versus the remake. And he said, let's say that the first version is the work of a talented amateur and the second was made by a professional. So that's where Hitchcock stood when he talked to Truffaut in like 1970s. Oh, that's fair enough. I mean, I know that in a couple of months we'll be tackling the remake, which I'm quite curious to check out. Um, it's, yeah. it's the second time we're doing this after Jackal, I think. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah, we would have done that earlier when we did the 39 Steps because there are remakes of that, but we didn't at the time think of swapping those into these like franchise release slots so so young and naive i know right so far so far away the heady days of the first few episodes of uh, spy hearts hmm. yeah uh would you have anything else for us cam on the uh, making of the film no that sums it up whoa 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 put the chairs down cam don't throw them at me <laughs> okay i know you want to talk about this film let's do it what do you think 2022 100 years since the book came out the man who knew too much the book that has nothing to do with the movie. Correct. <laughs> um, this is was an interesting one to go back and rewatch because my memories were really of the set pieces. I thought of the chair fight. I thought of just the scene in the church where everyone leaves except for the bad guys, and it's really tense. I thought of the um big orchestra concert at the uh, you know the big like finale. Well, it's not the finale because the shootout's the finale, but it leads into the big finale there. Um. So in terms of set pieces, this one had lingered in my mind fairly strongly. And um, going back to it, I found that in terms of the set pieces, I think it's pretty great. Like it's um, Hitchcock, not top tier. We're going to get with him, I think really the next year when you get to like 39 steps, it feels like a much more confident film. It was actually remarkable to me, like, that's the follow-up. Because it feels like there should be a couple years removed, a couple other maybe movies in between building up to that. But uh, he really does fly with the 39 Steps. This one feels like the building blocks of everything we're going to know, like, in terms of Hitchcock espionage films going forward. And because it's sort of the building blocks, it's a little clunky in places. Like, some of the plotting gets a little confusing. It's a 75-minute movie which on one hand is pretty great <laughs> for us to sit down and watch, you know, given that we sometimes wind up with two and a half hour movies, fitting them into a, you know, busy week. But um, some of the plot I found a little confusing, even on a revisit, but it's like the energy's there, the sort of sophisticated humor's there, um, the set pieces are there, as I said. And the one thing to me that's a little lacking is characters. Um, I think Peter Laurie's fantastic. And we'll talk about him, but like, in a movie that had a little more time, and the remake is two hours, you would just get to spend more time developing some of these, you know, villains and what have you. Okay. Well, it's it's an interesting one for me because I'm going in blind. You've seen it before. Mm -hmm. I definitely feel that this is like the beginning. Obviously, it's not his first film, Mr. Hitchcock, but he's starting to get a feel for it. But I don't think he's quite there. It feels like there's elements missing from it. And I couldn't really put my finger on what it was. I'm I'm not very good at sort of expressing how I feel about films sometimes. There was just like a something missing. I enjoyed bits of this film, like you said, the set pieces, the tension building, especially at the Royal Albert Hall. Like that, as the music swells, the cantata is playing, and then bang. It's great. That stuff's great. That's pure Hitchcock. But there's just moments where I just kind of feel like it fell flat and left me wanting, which is weird in a film that's 75 minutes. Like it... Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that the sequel will give me more and flesh everything out, like you say. But I don't know. I just I I enjoyed the story. As I say, I like the tension, like the spectacle. I wasn't a fan of the performances by a few people. Yeah, like I found. I don't know. Maybe this is where you come down. Like I find the two leads, um, you know, um, Leslie Banks and Edna Best as the couple. There's a couple issues I think here. One is like they're separated for most of the movie mm -hmm. and you don't kind of have a camaraderie. So like, it feels like it, you're getting a little wonky in terms of who's driving the movie. Uh, I would like to say, I, I, my memories of the uh, remake are that they're together a lot more and actually are going through a lot of this sort of espionage stuff together. 
Um, whereas here, it's like they really just kind of shift back and forth versus who's driving the movie. So you kind of lose like a central driving force. Yeah. Well, you just think of like the 39 Steps or uh, North by Northwest, which are obviously ones that are notorious. The the male and female leads are together. Yeah. Pretty much, not maybe the whole film, but a good part, a good chunk of the film. Cary Grant's almost always there with the love interest. But I'm not sure I was necessarily missing them being together. I, I think the, the, the idea of having a wait at home to wait for a phone call was a bit of a flimsy excuse. There's no reason why she couldn't have gone with him. But maybe that's just how things were done in those days. Woman at home, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, next year he does the 39 Steps. Yeah. So he shows it. He, he's learnt from this to have that. And that's, I mean, 39 Steps made the knock list. It's a fantastic film. It's one of the ones I will go back and revisit and have revisited since we covered it on the show. I like what the man who knew too much is doing. I just don't think it fully delivers. And it just leaves me a little bit empty, which is the first time of having a Hitchcock film on the show that I felt that. Now, we on the Patreon, we did cover To Catch a Thief, and I had the same experience. It wasn't one of his best around, like compared to some of his other pieces of work. But this is the first spy film I've watched of Hitchcock where I think I could have given him notes. Like I feel like he was missing a few steps. Yeah, it's weird, like, just how short it is. Like, I do think you just could flesh it out a little bit more. And I think it's, like, very clear when you get to the 39 steps, he just is more interested in the characters than he is here. Like, a lot of them just feel kind of like placeholders. Like, even the the main, you know, the husband character, Leslie Banks, whose character's name is Bob Lawrence, he's fun in parts like i kind of like the way they set him up where we're seeing his wife it's kind of just like this vivacious full of life you know woman and they're hanging out in switzerland and she's you know dancing with some of these other guys and the husband's just like oh he's faking sobbing like oh my god my wife my wife you know you dirty dog you're taking my wife away like just jokes like that like he has a sense of humor but um vivacious sure no wonder you've been having these nights alone cam What's wrong with Vivacious? I don't know. It's just a weird opening line. I don't know. That's... Hey, baby. You're looking pretty vivacious this evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's a correct word. I'm just, I'm, I'm just yanking the chain. Go on, buddy. Yeah. yeah. No, but like, um, I kind of like that he's, you know, kind of playing the stuffy Brit in all these scenes, but he also has this kind of like sly sense of humor. and Like with the string and like... stuff when he ties it on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great scene where, you know, he ties, you know, the, the thread or the yarn um, mm. from his wife's knitting onto the guy she's dancing with. And it sort of drags across the dance floor. Like, moments like that are really fun. And I think, like, we just, the movie would be better if you had more of their back and forth dynamic and banter. And then, like, at a certain point, too, the husband is just captured and, like, sitting in a room. And you kind of lose the personality of the character. And it becomes more of the plot driving the movie, which... The, as a plot, like, I think it's functional, and I think you, when you have, like, Peter Laurie as your villain, it, like, just is brought up several levels past what it even should. Like, I think Peter Laurie's great in this movie, um, but I would have just liked, I think, a little more of a focus on character-driven storytelling versus plot-based. That that might be the feeling I'm getting. I'm just not able to verbalize it as well as you are, but, yeah, it, it, it didn't do it for me as much as the previous entries on Hitchcock's list have for me, but... I think we should talk about things that we did like. Now, you mentioned Peter Laurie. Is that the first thing you want to bring up? Sure, let's bring up Peter Laurie. He's obviously an iconic actor, you know, shows up in movies like Casablanca and, you know, uh, Beat the Devil and just becomes this, like, legendary character actor, so known for that voice and just that presence. And here, in his first, you know, English-speaking role, could have been, you know, a bit of a stumbling block. He, he could have been awkward on screen. You know, a lot of actors are when they transition into English speaking films. And yet, like, he brings so much presence, like the scar, the streak of light hair, and just like how both like amused he is at everything that's going on, and also just how dangerous he seems. I'm not going to sit here and agree with you because I don't. Ooh, okay. This isn't like a particularly hot take. I like the look of the character and I like the presentation and I like the the dialogue that's written for him, I suppose. But I had trouble with his delivery and it was it felt very stilted and it made me kind of bump a bit. 
There was definitely some lines where I felt like he just read it off of a page. Now, you, you telling me that he this is his first English film and there's people saying he doesn't even speak English and he learnt it phonetically, that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, like, I, I understand why he's on the cover art for this film. Yeah. That he has a very striking image and, and that, that look and the way his presence is quite intimidating. I understand why he is the lead villain in this film. I just didn't get the delivery. And it it made me kind of cold to the character, which is probably one of the things that held it back for me. Hmm, interesting. See, to me, just the way he has that sort of like giggling sort of demeanor, like he will often just like laugh at situations and then turn around and just be so like like oozing just danger. To me, like it's the presence that carries it. Like I can totally look past some of the maybe awkward line delivery just because first off, his voice, his voice is a gift like Peter Lorre just is it's like one of the most iconic voices in movies and so like even if he's kind of maybe awkwardly phrasing some of his lines I'm like that voice is doing a lot of magic it's like Barry White (laughs) you know you listen to Barry White and you're like that voice will always work that's like Peter Lorre I don't think anyone's ever compared Peter Lorre to Barry White before but uh, I'm glad we can have that first here on Spy Hearts (laughs) it's like just those great voices you can always listen to you know Morgan Freeman is another example that would be a weird rendition of Ebony and Ivory. And I know that was obviously Stevie Wonder. <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> wow. Anyway. Um, okay, well, you liked it. I didn't. That's fine. I, I actually had him down as a dislike, but with an asterisk. Like, I liked some of the stuff, but I didn't like all of it. And I know people talk about Peter Laurie when they talk about this film. So I know it was going to be a point of contention with us. So I kind of wanted to get that out of the way. But there were things I did like. The first being just the plot. The spy plot. Who done it? The hostage situation, the man in the wrong place, all these sort of Hitchcock tropes that I guess is this is where it more or less begins for him. Um, he's he clearly knows how to do it, um, and I I like that stuff. Um, it was interesting. I didn't know where it was going. I did not know where the film was going for a good time. And you know, the guy gets shot, and then he finds the thing in the brush. And it slowly starts to unravel. But I didn't know that Peter Lorre was the villain until he turned up in the in the dentist i had no clue they do a really good job in like five minutes establishing what the espionage plot is who like the players are not necessarily the villains because you don't find out about some of them till later down the road but you kind of meet all these people at this you know switzerland resort and they're just kind of hanging around you get a little kind of flash of personality or just the idea of who they are a lot of them have sort of iconic faces and uh it's essentially really good setup for everything that's going to move on from there. Um, we watch so many movies, especially nowadays, <laughs> where you have to have 40 minutes of setup just to get to your story. This one does a really efficient job in like five minutes. Well, it doesn't suffer fools. It just presents it and very casually, and then that's it. You have to follow along. There was bits I picked up on my second viewing. For instance, when the, the guy who gets shot falls down the ski slope and lands at the feet. Yeah. This, this guy is the spy. He is the original person working for whatever the Secret Service was in England at that time. And the Peter Laurie character sees him as he gets up from the snow and is talking and then recognizes him, stops, gives him a weird look, and then continues talking. Yeah. You wouldn't really see it unless you're paying attention, but that's there. It's in the script. Yeah, it's all like, just pay attention. And this is obviously, if you think about it, this is 1934. Audiences are fairly relatively new to speaking films silent films have been you know going up until the uh, late 20s in terms of popularity so like an audience is very much trained to just observe behavior on screen versus nowadays where i think audiences depend a lot more on dialogue to explain things or to drive the story forward and as you said like a moment like that i do wonder if an audience in 1934 would have been more trained to just watch physical movements and facial reactions and what have you. Well, they're not looking at their phones. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, if they were, it's the old dial-up ones, <laughs> the old <laughs> rotary phones. <laughs> yeah. A weird place to be looking. Why are you all looking off to the one phone box on the side of the room? <laughs> this is probably the only time in the review I can point this out. But there was a funny moment when we're introduced to the whole spy story where our character of Bob Lawrence, played by Leslie Banks, the sort of the protagonist, really, is being questioned by the police. Yep. And he's waiting to speak to the inspector, I believe, in the other room. He's with a guard who is speaking, I think, either French or German. I can't remember. 
Um, and he's doing this, uh, that thing you do when you go abroad and you don't speak the language. And so you add like eh on the end. <laughs> do you know uh, where the thingy is? Or you talk really loudly at them to, to expect them to understand English more if you shout at people. Um, which is a very trashy thing that we do. I, I'm sure you're familiar with the phenomena. Oh, of course, of course. And this movie doesn't have as much time to play around with the uh, foreign location. Um, it's back to Britain pretty quickly. Hmm. Um, the remake spends, it's set in Morocco off the bat, and they do spend more time in Morocco. Uh, so, like, I did really like that scene with the with the guard um, or the officer where he's just, like, trying to communicate because I think, like, it sort of helps uh, uh, escalate sort of the intensity of the espionage where you're trapped in a situation and you can't communicate with people either. I think that actually makes it a little tenser. Yeah, I agree. But it did remind me of something that happened to me in my childhood that I, I thought would be interesting to point out. And probably the only time I can ever talk about this on the podcast. So would you like to hear a story, Cam? I would. Okay. So when I was young, the first time I went to France, I went to Calais, which is uh, basically just across the, the, the pond from England. It's like the first stop on the on the on the train over as you as you go to France. And so we went there for a day out. And now when I was younger, I was a bit of a fussy eater. Uh, shock horror i only liked food that came in the color beige right uh, a lot of kids diets these days unfortunately and so my parents took us as me and my brothers and the family to mcdonald's which would be fine but my dad decided to go and talk to to order for us now i liked my hamburgers with nothing on them we're talking bun burger bun plain you go to a, a burger place you order a plain burger that's what you're going to get Unfortunately, my dad, obviously not speaking French, and none of us speaking French, goes up to the, the cashier at McDonald's and says, Le hamburger, no shit. Wow. And it worked. Really? Yeah, I got no shit. Okay. There you go. Weird, weird thing, and I'm sorry that's like a, a bit of a spin-off story, but it, was, it, it popped into my mind immediately when he was making that sort of... Uh, that, that, that trying to talk to people who don't speak the same same language as you. Right, right. That didn't give me the comedy I thought it would out of you, Cam. So uh, maybe we'll just uh, <laughs> we'll just not talk about my my history anymore. <laughs> well, I would have liked that line in this movie. It would have been good if he'd uh, thrown that one at the guard. <laughs> um, but what, something else you liked, Cam? The set pieces. I think like these are some really memorable, fun set pieces that. I think elevate the movie a lot. Like I will totally go back and rewatch the man who knew too much because of these set pieces. And I mean, the suspense is there. Like there's a lot of that early on, but just that whole orchestra sequence where you have Jill Lawrence running around, you know, unsure what's going on, recognizing that like there is going to be an assassination attempt, seeing the gun and you're just waiting for that musical cue to go off. Like the genius of Hitchcock there is setting up that musical cue of when, you know, the symbols of when the assassination is actually going to happen earlier. And then you're just waiting for it to happen throughout. It's the old, you know, if there's a bomb under a table and you know the bomb's there, it makes it suspenseful. That's the story I always hear about Hitchcock. But it was interesting to see it in action like this because he, he told you the bomb was there and you had to wait for it to explode. But yeah, that whole scene in the Royal Albert Hall, second time that showed up on the podcast. Nice to see the Royal Albert Hall back. Yeah. Um, and that was actually inside. It's what it looks like. So they did film inside the Albert Hall. Oh, interesting. And when I visit, uh, you know, London, we'll go there, we'll attend an orchestra, and I'll stand up and scream in the middle of the show. <laughs> You'll be doing that all over London, to be fair, because I'll be kicking you down the stairs. <laughs> yeah. That also. <laughs> um Yeah, but when the cantata was playing, it was going to the, the crescendo at the end. A genius bit of filmmaking. Uh, that's probably my highlight of the film is that whole build up in in the Albert Hall, and sit and watching like the ticking clock as they're waiting for it to happen in the background, and her slowly looking around the room, and then I feel like they're trying to go for that whole like she's getting dizzy and having a panic attack again, like she did at the start of the film, but she doesn't that time, and she managed to keep herself awake, spots the guy, screams, and saves his life. I think th is that what you thought they were going for as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's really interesting as well that the assassin is the character of Ramon, played by Frank Vosper, or Vosper, and um, earlier on we see that the wife is engaged with, like, a um, clay pigeon shooting contest with him, 
And so it's really cool to have that connection between the assassin and the wife. And that pays off at the end in the big shootout where she's the one that shoots him off the roof. Which, like, that's crazy. I was, like, totally forgetting that when I rewatched the movie. And pretty badass, I gotta say. Yeah. When I was watching the film and the shootout at the end and then they turned up with the rifles, it clicked in my head. I was like, oh, she's good at clay pigeon shooting. Grab the rifle, make the shot. And they did it. And I was like, oh. That's that's really good. That's great storytelling. That's like a bookends of your film. You, you you set it up at the start and you paid it off at the end. This is really simple stuff, but I feel like films now just kind of forget to do that. I mean, Joe Lawrence, badass of the movie, right? Absolutely. Apart from the guy who let his tooth get pulled out to try and save the daughter. Another good set piece. And that was some rapid dentistry. Like that guy walked into that room, they closed the door and he was out in like 20 seconds. <laughs> He wouldn't have even got gas and air at that point. I think the guy just, just straight up went in with the uh, the pliers and ripped that sucker out. Brutal. And apparently that scene, the dentist scene, was supposed to be a barber shop. And they ended up changing it because the movie I Was a Member of a Chain Gang had come out and featured a barber sequence that was kind of tense. So Hitchcock said, oh, crap, change that. Uh, and so they made it a dentist office instead. I thought it was really effective. Like just from the scary looking teeth sign on the door and then like the dentist who feels like he's escaped from like a horror movie like a universal horror movie is a mad scientist or something and i loved how they set that up where the uncle goes in and then emerges like holding his mouth in pain and then your protagonist or one of the protagonists you know bob lawrence goes in and then we get to follow him actually into the office and go through this whole tense kind of standoff with this dentist i thought that was a really strong set piece as well Absolutely, and I had a question for you. If it was going to be a barbershop, what's the barbershop version of getting a tooth pulled? It has to be a razor, right? Like a shave? Yeah, but that doesn't hurt. Well, it does if you do it wrongly. <laughs> so you think it's a it's a, a razor cut? I would have to imagine, because I just... Unless it's like Wayne's World, a movie we covered on Patreon, unless it's like the um, suck cut... You know, pulling the hair out of the head while he screams. Like, I don't know of a way a barbershop scene in a Hitchcock movie would be that intense. It has to be like a shave where, like, he's getting the shave. The guy's got the razor to the throat. And he's starting to question him about, um, you know, these various, um, you know, espionage elements of the plot. That that would seem to me to make the most sense. Hmm. I wonder what it is in the follow-up. Oh, in the, uh, in the remake? Hmm. Uh, I can't remember. Um, they may have just dropped that whole section. I don't remember. I think the dentist bit's quite effective. I think the only bit of the film that... Actually, I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. My last thing that I liked, is kind of a small thing, was the spy and the way he was dispatched. I liked that he was shot through the window, but what I really liked was his answer to it. Some people were like, oh, oh, I've been shot. Call for a doctor. He just looks down at the bullet when he goes, oh, Look, sorry. <laughs> I made it. <a, laughs> I mean, I, I made a note even when the bullet comes through the glass and you get that like very subtle noise of the bullet merging the glass, just like very beautiful look of kind of that spider web around the window where the bullets come in. I wrote, even the bullet shot is dignified in this movie. Everyone's dignified. <laughs> <laughs> a very British affair. It really is like... um. Even the assassination stuff, as you said, is very like, mm, yes, well, I guess I'm going to die now. Okay, mm -hmm. then. <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs> yep. Pip, pip. Bye-bye. <laughs> Someone play me out. God save the queen. <laughs> well, that, that'll be an interesting comparison when we get to the remake. Is because by this point, I think Hitchcock's in Hollywood. Um, you mean for the remake? Oh, yeah. The, the yeah. remake is a Hollywood movie starring an American star. So it's it's an American Hollywood affair. Like it. And that, and that that's the concern I have, although I've heard that the, the remake is better, but I, I will put that on hold and you know, observe it myself. But you know, look at the difference between The Day of the Jackal and The Jackal. One was a French film, the other was an abomination. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when they do the remake of this, it's Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day, two of the biggest stars in Hollywood. It has a massive budget. They're on location in Morocco, like it's... Uh, Definitely a big movie. Everything you just said sounds good, but you could apply the same logic to The Jackal. You could. You could. More money and stars doesn't necessarily equal a great movie. Just in terms of comparison from this one, 
it's a much bigger blockbuster than this film. Well, that will be interesting to tackle down the line. But next up, let's talk about things we didn't necessarily like. Now, I said Peter Laurie was kind of in between my lists, so I guess he's my first thing, but I've already aired my grievances about him. So what's something you weren't a big fan of? Um, I think I kind of hinted at it earlier, where it's just like the dynamic between Bob and Jill is so much fun in the setup that I think when they get separated, the movie just loses energy. And, you know, Jill just gets sidelined for a big section while we're following Bob and the uncle like the uncle is fun um i don't want to see the wife have to deal with the scene where she gets the tooth ripped out obviously that character is there to serve that sort of function that sort of comedic bumbling stuff but the idea of the couple investigating the espionage because they want to save their daughter is more compelling to me i guess oh there's more stakes in the game and especially because the the cousin uncle or butler i could i had to look out who he was because i couldn't really figure it out for a while <laughs> He did seem like a butler, but um, he has far less stakes and he's just kind of inserted and there's no real setup as to why he is or who he is particularly. Yeah. So you have no investment. So when he gets his teeth pulled out or his tooth pulled out, much as you go, Ugh, you don't really care. Well, he's there because it's like they want to insert him into the dangerous situations for comedy. And like this movie is more often than not aiming for comedy than just genuine thrills. And so it's like, you know, you have that character, obviously, as I said, at the dentist, but also at the uh, Tabernacle of the Sun being hypnotized. Another great sequence, actually, where, you know, the scene at the church there. But um, you have that moment where he's being hypnotized and, like, his vision's going all blurry as, as he stares at the woman who's hypnotizing him. And they're kind of shooting, like, comedic shots of him looking kind of dazed. So it's like, this character is basically here to just kind of experience danger in kind of a lighthearted way. Which I guess is okay, but I I wasn't looking for a comedy. Sure. I suppose. I, I, it wasn't a comedy until that point, and the stakes are involved as they've had their daughter kidnapped, and there's a potentially a, a Franz Ferdinand-level assassination about to happen. But let's focus on this guy going doolally from being hypnotized. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, it, it bumped me a little bit. But then you say you quite liked the 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 tabernacle of the sun or whatever it was called that whole church scene for me felt completely pointless like really it didn't do anything apart, apart from like having the people stand up and it reveals that the bad guys are there which i i get is a good reveal there's a whole like where they're pretending to sing, sing a hymn and they don't know the words they're like making stuff up off the page and it's just like what what is this why are we not continuing the plot it feels a little too goofy for a movie in which their daughter's kidnapped. Although, to be fair, their daughter's kidnapped and they don't even seem that upset when they're at their house. They're kind of like, oh, you know, these things happen. But when they get her back, they're like, oh, that's a nice dressing gown. Where did you get it? <laughs> so, um, the, to me, the tabernacle scene just has so much um, atmosphere. And just like that woman giving the sermon and just the chair fight at the end is pretty glorious. Come on. The chair fight is, I, I would almost separate those two bits. I know it's one sort of sequence, but like the sermon and the hypnotism uh, just didn't work for me. And then he runs off and gets told off by a police officer and then it starts fighting with chairs. That's kind of fun. I like the chair fight because it's, it's not particularly crazy. It's like, it's more like a desperation move. Like he has no weapons and they can't shoot guns. So he's like, well, I'm going to try and save my own life. I'm going to start throwing chairs. What else have you got in the church? Yeah. That makes sense. But the, I, I, the sermon didn't work for me. Yeah. But, like, getting back to just my issue with, like, that uncle character, too. It's, like, the, um, you know, uh, the main character, Bob, gets kidnapped and taken in by, you know, these villains. And the uncle goes to get the police. And the police basically just, you know, ultimately turn on him when the bad guys are like, oh, this guy's just bothering us. And so it's, like, this character's, he doesn't achieve anything. He's very ineffective. And he's basically just there to be bumbling. Um... So I would have preferred, like, insert little bumbling gags with him, but don't make him so central to what's going on in the investigation throughout, you know, the middle sections of the movie. Well, it, it sounds like uh, Hitchcock has, has already figured that out for the remake. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're giving him notes and he agrees with you. So you have the same mind as Alfred Hitchcock. Congratulations. And I mean, also, just because Bob's kidnapped at a certain point, you just don't have anyone driving the story for a long time. And that feels kind of weird. Well, they just become passengers at that point. It's, yeah. It's down to the work of the police and they, they're nameless, you know, 
coats. Yeah. So, well, I, and that actually kind of brings me on to one of the things I had a trouble with, and that is the shootout. I mean, no, this is no like House on 92nd Street <laughs> shootout. There's no grenades going through the windows. <laughs> You know what? I would love to do a commentary on that movie for the Patreon, but like, no one wants to listen to that. <laughs> Maybe we'll put out like a little. Or we have a few more people to jump on the Patreon. We'll, we'll put out like a little uh, poll and see what people want because I, we would have a lot of fun taking that film to pieces. But if you just want like a, a, a eighty minute diss track, I'm sure we could do that for a lot of the films. Sure. Um, but the shootout. Is a is an interesting sequence, and you know it's staged really well, and and you know the dynamics of it having the police go around and try and get lines of sight on the building, and there's a lot of death, and there's a lot of tension being built. You know, there's there's bullets going through windows at people, even where like the chief inspector is and stuff like that. There's tension. I just feel like it goes on slightly too long. It might have the highest body count of any Hitchcock movie. I, it's That's crazy. I was like racking my brain thinking about that. I think it might. Because like a lot of people get shot down in this movie. And he's not really prone to like grandiose um, you know, shootouts. Well, it, it's not played explicitly, is it? There's a couple of headshots that have... Well, you would see a bullet hole. So they do have that on screen. But most of the nameless, uh, you know bad guys and nameless police officers are just sort of gunned down and you can't see any blood and they just sort of fall to the floor, which is a respectful way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, I, I just... It was interesting because I, I really liked it, but I, I saw the bit where... Before, where the, the Royal Albert Hall crescendo... I was like, this is the end of the film, right? Surely they've been thwarted. Police are going to kick down the door and arrest them. But then there's like another 20 minutes of a shootout, which I, I'm, I think the shootout is a good idea and I would have it at the end of the film. And I also think, like, you know, shortening this film would be weird, but I just felt like that bit went on a bit too long, and that's probably because our protagonists aren't really doing anything. I think that's the issue with it, because I think the actual shootout is masterful. Like, Hitchcock directs the hell out of it. There's so many cool moments, and I love, like, for example, the, uh, you know, the hypnotist lady from the tabernacle going to, like, fetch ammunition, and just, like, how tense they make that up with the, you know, the bad guys up in their hideout. Um, so there's like a lot of moments. I also like the police having the meeting in the chocolate shop and ordering tea while they're doing it. <laughs> it's a very British affair, once again. <laughs> that made me laugh. So in terms of just the technique, it's very cool. Like it's a great sequence, mm -hmm. but you are right. Like it does sideline the protagonists. And, you know, we get an escape from Bob, you know, at a certain point, um, which is which is fine. And then you get the wife pulling the trigger at the end of the shootout which is awesome but in terms of the grandeur picture as you said like it's a you know a 15 minute sequence or something like that they don't really factor into it too much and then he does make that escape and you're like oh something's happening and he gets shot yeah it's just the energy's gone again i, I don't know what about you something else you didn't like um okay i well i don't even know if it's something i didn't like i would just like maybe your interpretation of it what happened to Peter Lorre at the end of this movie? He was shot through the door. Was he, or did he shoot himself? Hmm. Well, I watched it twice, and both times I got the impression that the uh, police inspector of the game was there shot him. I rewound it and watched, because there's no bullet holes that appear in that door. And there's no, like, visible signifier that those guns have been fired. And we just see one shot fire out to the right of the door... So I was like, did he just shoot himself in the head or something? Well, they use the sound cue of his pocket watch to signify he's there. So you know he's behind the door. So I suppose we should talk about what Hitchcock was trying to craft with that. Like, is he trying to make us question it? Or is it more cut and dry? Is it, is it quite simple? I, I got the impression that they shot him, the police. Yeah, well, that's what it seems like it should be, the watch going off and then them shooting at the door, but it's like there's no squibs going off on the door at all. Um, so that's why I was... But they never really do that in the film, to be fair. There's no... But there's also no sound. There's one gunshot sound. And sure. and we see... Well, that could have been the police. But we see the smoke from the gun fire off to the right of the door, which would imply it's him. We we see the gunshot from... You see... We see the smoke from where? Oh, coming from out, like, to the right of the door. So it's it's emerging from where Peter Laurie is. Huh. Well, in that scenario, I would assume he's, he shot himself, but I never saw the smoke. Yeah, like you actually see, like, you know, the gun smoke. Um, 
to the right of the door from where he's, he's hiding. Well, that, that just plays into what we were talking about earlier, to be fair. Like this, this film, much like a lot of earlier films, requires you pay attention. Yeah. And I wasn't not paying attention. I just logically followed it through that he was caught behind the door and they shot him. I did, I did kind of bump on that, though, because I thought, well, surely they would just arrest him. Right. So why would they shoot him? But now you saying that means it's actually a lot more logical that he took his own life. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, maybe it's up for interpretation. How did you at home think this film ended? Let us know. <laughs> They're like, it's very obvious. How did you guys not notice? <laughs> well, apparently you got it right. I'm the idiot. I'm not saying I got it that right. Is, that's just that's completely on brand. I'm just going visually off what I could make sense of. That's what I got. That was my Sh- take. Should we take this to Wikipedia? Um, we could. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> well, uh, I guess we have our answer. Uh huh. Should I read out the excerpt? Sure, please. Okay. <clears throat> the police storm the building. Abbott, the criminal mastermind, is hiding inside, but he is betrayed by the chiming of his watch. He shoots himself, as shown by the gunshot smoke, and dies. That's interesting, though, that he's given away by the chime, because you would think the chime would lead to the police turning on and catching him or shooting him, right? So maybe the point they're trying to make is that if the watch hadn't have gone off, he wouldn't have taken his own life and he would have tried to escape. Possibly, yeah. Which is very Home Alone. <laughs> he's, one, he's the original wet bandit. <laughs> it's like such throwing paint pots at people. <laughs> More chairs. <laughs> I'll get you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that was a... Well, okay, I guess that clears it up. Yeah, neither of us were. I, I guess you were more right than I was. Actually, I was wrong. You were right. That's thank the, you. That's thank the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you that one, Cam. I'll give you that one. But I was only right because I rewound because I was like, "Whoa, I'm confused about what just happened." Which, which means again, once again, I tip my hat to to Hitchcock. There, I, he's crafted a film where you have to pay attention, and I think that that if you showed this to a modern audience, this film, a lot of people would skip that. Yeah, I think actually, a lot of people would be confused about the connecting of the dots of the spy plot in this movie if you showed them to you know if they watch it now and that's partly because i think at 75 minutes they compress a lot of it like they just kind of will toss off one line of explanation and they just expect you to just go along for the ride but also something you touched on and maybe something i can say that was a little bit of an issue was some of the sound recording on the voices is iffy uh it's often i found tough to understand the dialogue now i will say as i said um up front originally i watched a dvd that the quality was brutal like it was a real struggle to you know make it through that 75 minutes but i watched the criterion blu-ray for this watch and it was significantly improved but there are a couple moments where you kind of lean forward and go eh well i also watched the criterion version and i still had trouble both times with the, the audio. And my TV has a good setup. It's not that. So it, it must have just been the recording techniques were just quite primitive at that point. And you said it hadn't been many, that many years since the you know, the audio era had begun. Yeah. So I, I understand how the techniques weren't as great. But it's just interesting that I, I actually had genuine trouble at times sit, hearing what they were saying. Especially the bit towards the beginning. Yeah. In that sort of way, you get a lot of the motivations for people and you learn that the daughter's been kidnapped. You can visually see that, but chatting with the inspector and the murder and all this sort of... And like the jabs between the couple and and the spy, the lighthearted stuff, a lot of that goes over your head because you can't really hear it. Yeah, and I noticed it was sometimes voice specific. Like I found like Jill Lawrence's voice was perfect. Like, boy, like crystal clear. I never had a single issue in understanding anything she said through the movie. But there was some other characters where I was like, okay, I think that line kind of went over my head. I maybe missed that. And I remember having a similar issue when I watched um, the Hitchcock movie Young and Innocent from like a year or two later and struggling with that one. I think really beyond those two, though, I don't know that I've had many issues with his stuff. Well, the 39 Steps was never a problem for me, and that was in the next year. Yeah, no, I didn't have a problem with that. And that was some of that was outside, on the Scottish moors, and that was still fine. Although they probably re-recorded that dialogue after the fact, I would guess. Don't, don't ruin this for me, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Well, that's all sort of my likes and dislikes about the film. So let's just sort of wrap up with any final points and, and questions we've got. I did have a question for you. Well, it's sort of a double barrel question. Firstly, is this our shortest film ever? Yes, and it will... Oh, I was about to say it probably will be the shortest we ever do, but I think we're going to do Buster Keaton's The General. I think that might be a little bit shorter. Okay, now, and as a follow-up to that, and this isn't the second part of the question, is this the general length of films at this point? Mm, no, but they do tend to skew shorter, so there's a lot of 90-minute movies. Um, you don't have a lot of two-and-a-half-hour films from the 30s. They tend to fall shorter. There's there's a really weird split because I just found out the other day from yourself, I believe, that the new Batman film is going to be three hours long. Yeah. And I compare that to this, and yet I feel like there's far more content in these 75 minutes than there will be in those three hours. And I think I would sooner end up like his parents than watch a three-hour Batman film. It is insane. And it's something that I tend to find with we can talk about hitchcock you know a lot of the hitchcock stuff 39 steps is another good example and a lot of the ones we'll cover you know in the future as well as we did you know as we said um to catch a thief was like 100 minutes or something and like these movies they don't feel short and like empty it feels like there's so much on screen and so much depth to them so much to dig into and they aren't that long they don't need three hours so um, you know, we're just wrapping up, you know, the 2021 movie season is now behind us. And like the last like month of that was me watching countless two and a half hour movies. Like every movie that came out in theaters that was like kind of a prestige film or a big studio film was two and a half hours. It was crazy. I, I have no problem with film length if it's earned. Yeah. Or there's something, there's information to give or there's a story to tell. Endgame had a story. Infinity War had a story and it had to get all these characters in it was a very long and winding road and i think that film delivered in and i think the three hours was probably the perfect mark for it but there's no reason why a batman origin story film should be three hours i just think there's an artistry to short filmmaking i think you can make a 90 minute or in this case a 75 minute film that like moves keeps an audience engaged and they're not walking out angry because it's short <laughs> you know what i mean but i it, i suppose this is an argument and we could sort of segue into this quickly is if you ask the cinema chains, they want shorter films because they can have more showings in a day, therefore they sell more tickets, blah, blah, blah. But in this world of HBO Max and Disney+, Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, I don't know, Tubi, it's all that content. Yeah. And they, they count by eyes on the screen. So is, is the content concept winning currently? I would say so. They want you sitting... And just watching their service for as long as humanly possible. So, you know, you could say a three-hour Batman movie seems ridiculous, but they're going to lock you onto your couch for three hours in the future when this is streaming on HBO Max, and you are going to be, you know, just sitting there using their service. I just don't like that. I, I mean, yeah, okay, I can pause it and go to the toilet, and I will. I unlike seeing it in the cinema. I quite like the idea that you can do that. But I'll see a lot of these films in the theaters. I won't see them on home release, and I probably won't watch them again because they are so long. I will be very curious going forward. Um, you know, I grew up, you know, in my era where we would rewatch Ghostbusters and Star Wars movies over and over again. But it's also like they're like an hour 45 or two hours. Like, I was just fascinated to see in the future generations how many people are just sitting and watching the three hour Endgame on a loop or the three hour Batman film on a loop. Like, it'll just be interesting to see. Well, this is what put me off from watching uh, the Justice League remake for so long as I didn't want to sit through a four hour film. Now I know it's cleverly built into smaller chunks and they have like, it has like built in sections with like titles for each section. And that's how I found it digestible. But I don't think you could put that film in theaters. Oh no, definitely not. That four hour justice league, I guess, original version, really the Zack Snyder version. Um, no, you couldn't have done that. I, I like that. We're talking about Zack Snyder's justice league in a podcast on Hitchcock's and the man who knew too much. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. We like to surprise people. We are a spy podcast, after all. True. You never know what's going to happen. And what's more spy than Justice League? <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't black and white. It was kind of noir-esque. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the second part of my question, sorry, just to bring us back on the tracks, is, is this our oldest film? Um, yeah, I think it is currently, yes. 
I know we're looking at the, the general again, as you said, but yeah, I, I I had this fear, I've spoken about it before, about going back to these old films. This is, as much as I think we've pointed out 92nd Street is the reason I don't like older films, this doesn't have some of the problems of that. I think this film holds up. I mean, it's 75 minutes. It moves. So you can't say it kind of drags or doesn't have any energy. It's just like in terms of, I think, storytelling, it gets a little wobbly. But in, if you know, if you're just tuning in for set pieces and Hitchcock wit, it does deliver that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, what about you? Any sort of points or questions you have? Yeah, I had a couple like moments I wanted to just touch on. Um, I thought the kid that played the daughter, uh, Nova Pilbeam, that that daughter, that's that's some nineteen thirties precocious child acting right there. That's really uh, aggravating. And she was, she was, yeah. Although I loved the shot he had of when she's kidnapped, and you just see the shot of her face looking terrified with the hand over her mouth and there's just like fur all around it it's almost like a fairy tale image and you zoom out and you see the guy in like the fur coat holding her on the sled with like the bells going off i thought that shot was brilliant it didn't need to say anything else it was the perfect delivery of the fact that she's been kidnapped yes exactly so i thought that was great I, I, another film would give you a five minute exposition scene about it mm-hmm um, another scene I really enjoyed was the introduction of Gibson, the secretary to the foreign office, who's just like sitting there, like putting the stuff in his pipe and looking very like cool and calm and collected before he, uh, talks to Bob about, well, you know, we'd like you to give us the uh, information to stop this assassination. But like Gibson was a very cool character who I would totally buy as a spy and watch in a spinoff movie. I, I just love that scene because they've cleverly constructed the set where he's hidden around the corner. So when... Jill comes back in the room. She's like, you haven't told him anything, have you, darling? And he's like, uh... And then the guy's like, <laughs> not yet! And stuffs his pipe a bit more. And it's like, oh, that's a, that's a clever bit of storytelling there. But I, I, branching off from that, I did have a question for you about that. Yeah. I mean, neither of us are parents. I don't want to be a parent. Uh, that's too much responsibility for me. I don't want this question. But if you were, and you had the choice between potentially saving the planet from World War II, well, two at that point in time. Or saving your child, potentially. Would you give up the information or would you deceive the person from the Secret Service? I think what makes that one tough is that there's too many variables with the this is going to cause a world war. It's like they can say that, but is it? Versus like my child's in danger and theoretically going to be killed by these villains. So like that is a pretty much a certainty to me. Well, the child is kidnapped. That is a certainty. So, yes. And I would feel like the danger to the child is much more um, looming than another world war. Like, possibly. But, again, you're having to accept a lot of logistics for that to be the case at the end of the day. Yeah, there is a lot of mental gymnastics to justify telling the information to potentially save the planet. But I, I, I can see his point. Yeah. But would you trust him? Like, I don't know that you would trust this guy who's just like, oh, I'm a secretary for the foreign office. Like, okay, sure. You're also like creeping around corners of my, you know, office and like, uh, you know, kind of duping us. Well, he doesn't do himself any favors because he snuck in with the police. Yeah. And he's pretended to be a police officer and the police have gone along with it as well, which is the weirdest thing. They've been like, oh, yeah, they haven't even mentioned him. He's just kind of there. And then he, they leave and he's still sitting there stuffing his pipe. Yeah. And 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 that's just a uh, l- little bit. Of, actually, I suppose it's a little bit of spy work, a little bit of subterfuge there. And I just think, like you know, the married couple are more um, content trusting each other and trying to accomplish what these uh, villains want than this guy who seems like he could be shady. Who really knows? Well, I, I, to be fair, I suppose I should back up a point I said in the previous episode when we spoke about War of the Worlds, the Tom Cruise film on the Patreon. I said. If the world went to crap, I don't care about anyone else. Right. My immediate family is all I'm trying to save. If someone else runs up and says, oh, help me, you can get stuffed. Yeah. I'm stealing that car and I'm driving off with my family. That's all I care about. So I guess I kind of get them saving the child. I think it makes sense. Um, you know, a parent... It's not a stretch. One... It's not a stretch. It's just no. that I was, I was curious as to where you fell on it. Yeah. Like, I think a parent's number one job is to protect their child. So they're going to put that ahead of anything else. I feel the same way. About my Star Trek figure collection. <laughs> he ain't lying, folks. 
I ain't. <laughs> right, anything else worth cap? Yeah, um, there is a moment of real dark comedy um, in this shootout section where you have that major where they're like, go knock on the door of the building. <laughs> and it's this like long walk of this guy going up, knocking on the door, and then just getting shot down. And they're like, hmm, well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and then they send like five people, don't they, after that? Yeah, and then they get shot at, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is a little moment of dark comedy. Kind of Lemmings-esque. It's like they're just mindless drones being sent against something. It's uh, well, I, I quite like the, um, not the shooting of the police, but I just quite like that there's a price. There's very real stakes. It doesn't mess around this film. It doesn't, it's not, it's not giving you the fluffy, like, oh, the guy got punched and he might have got knocked down and knocked out, but he's not dead. Yeah. It's people are getting killed left and right. And these guys mean business and they will shoot to kill. Right, and this is also, I believe, before the uh, the really strong censorship in the U.S. with films. So, like something like this, the shootout, I don't think you would have been able to stage it in this same way in the next few years uh, and have it shown in America. I don't think so. I never get stuff like this because we, at this point we just come out of a world war and they've seen footage of the war and they know what it looks like and it's not something where you know uninformed about so we know what death looks like unfortunately especially around that time so hiding it is weird but yeah i'm glad they presented it in this way i think it has a lot to do with the fact that in that era movies were all ages no matter what you know any child's going to your movie so it's kind of like do we want children watching um you know like (laughs) i remember watching uh tarzan and his mate um which was the second uh johnny weissmuller tarzan film and it's like pretty sexy it's like there's nude um bathing together and stuff there's no uh hiding what jane is getting out of this relationship uh they really do play up the uh, sexuality going on and i just think like when you see the tarzan movies that came after post code they were like oh no no this is unacceptable they had they had far less bananas the far less bananas and jane's um you know jungle bikini is gone <laughs> you know like it's like, no, no, it's more about family values at this point. And so they're um, coming down on these movies that kids would have been going to all this stuff. Kids would have been going to see... Was she in see... like a sweater and a long skirt in a jungle in the follow-ups? It's basically a much longer like jungle dress. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so like a movie like this where you have like a lot of police officers being shot down this way, I don't think they would have shown that in theaters a couple of years later. No, and I appreciate like at the end when the daughter's finally rescued, she's not like... Oh, mummy, I've missed you so much. She's just screaming. Yeah. She's just surrounded by death. She's just screaming. She can't get over it. She's going to be having trouble with that for many years. And it doesn't It doesn't make it like a, a sweeping score. Ah, they've been reunited. It's just like, ah, this is terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I, is actually something I should, I'm going to bring up before we bring it to a close. And it's maybe something I bumped on, but I, I, it was okay without, but it was interesting that there was no score. Yeah. The only uses of music are at the either end of the film, which is kind of the intro and outro stuff, and then the uh, the cantata at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, it, there was times where I thought it could have done with a bit of orchestral pieces to carry things along a little bit, especially when they were thrown to chairs. I think that you know the Benny Hill music would have been perfect in that scene, <laughs> but that wasn't made yet. So yeah, um, I think it's smart just to leave the music to that orchestra section because it just makes that stand out all the more that that's the one use of music really in the actual narrative of the film and it has so much stakes attached to it it makes it it, it, it punctuates it it that this is the there's music playing something's happening that makes sense should there have been a cymbal player show up and clash the cymbals when she takes the shot on the bad guy at the end <laughs> that is very very like hot shots or naked gun <laughs> That's like the moment where Hitchcock loses his mind. It's like, yeah, this seems like a good idea. <laughs> I saw it. And then that, that car from Naked Gun drives through and drives yeah. through the door up the stairs. <laughs> da-da-da, da-da-da, da-da-da. <laughs> oh, that feels like a fan edit ready to be made. <laughs> Get on that, Scott. I'll, I'll try. But uh, I think that brings us to the inevitable question. Is the man who knew too much making the knock list cam what do you think this is in some ways a tough one because it is like the building blocks of 
everything we're going to appreciate in Hitchcock going forward in movies like North by Northwest and The 39 Steps and some others we haven't covered yet on the show. But I, I just think, like, it's more, I think, interesting for scholars um, and, like, diehard Hitchcock fans than to recommend to people looking just for spy films. Um, so it's a very mild no, but it's one that I'm going to rewatch this movie many times going forward. I just don't know that it speaks to the best of what Hitchcock does in spy films. Okay, so that's a no from you. I noted down in my research that this was like the beginning of his spy work. And when I was thinking about it, you know, 39 Steps was the next year. 20 years time, he's making stuff like North by Northwest. But in between, he's got Notorious, other films like that. This is his Doctor No. But do you know what Doctor No had over this film? What did it have? James Bond. True. It had Sean Connery and a lead actor it followed all the way through and focused on. This film didn't really have a protagonist that got a lot of screen time. He was in it for the first 40 minutes and then he's just kind of tied up in a chair and then gets shot. I think that holds it back. And I think there's some t filmmaking techniques with the, the audio is a bit messy. And so I, I think it's a no. It, it's not a disappointment. I think if you say, as you say, scholars might check it out, Hitchcock fans would watch it, I would think so. If you're also trying to complete the spy pantheon like we are, I would say check it out. But is it a need to see? That's the first part. That's the N. Also, in knock is no. It's a no. Yeah, I think I would be more willing to bend to saying yes to this one on the knock list if you don't have 39 Steps one year later. Like, if 39 Steps was, like, five or six years later, i go, okay, well, this one's really important, and we're going to see him build up his skills to the 39 Steps over the next handful of years. Versus, like, I'm going from this to the next one. And the next one is so infinitely superior that you go like, holy smokes. It's kind of, I mean, you know, you mentioned Batman earlier. It's kind of like going from Batman Begins to the Dark Knight. It feels like the Dark Knight is him going, I know how to make a Batman movie and I'm going to make a great one. Whereas like Batman Begins, you know, I really enjoy it, but it's kind of clunky in spots. And that's kind of how I feel with this, you know, these two films. I think that's a, a, a spot on analogy. And we're once again talking about Batman in a podcast about the man who knew too much. If only Hitchcock had made a Batman movie, it would, you know, close the circle. Is it the, the Batman who knew too much? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh that's good. <laughs> I'll save that one for the end. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like it's two no's. Uh, this is not an avoid by any stretch of the imagination. This is nowhere near a disavowed. It's just not quite up to the par that we're expecting from a Hitchcock film and we're expecting from a spy film to recommend it to you as need to see. So... The man who knew too much, two knows, therefore is not making the knock list and the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. Now, Cam, before we talk about what we're doing next week, what have we got coming up on the Patreon? Well, we are going to be tackling next Goodwill Hunting in our Agents in the Field series where we look at popular spy actors in their non-spy roles. And I think uh, for Matt Damon, Goodwill Hunting, bit of an important movie. Um, also recently, we've talked about War of the Worlds as well as Wayne's World. And in our commentaries, we recently did The Born Identity. So it's a Matt Damon party over on the Patreon right now. Yeah, I don't have a lot of memory of Goodwill Hunting, except it being a good film. So I, uh, I'm glad we went back and tackled it on the show. But if you want to support Spy Hards, and remember, this is a free podcast. We tried, we're tried. we keeping it ad-free just for you. So if you can spare the couple of dollars every month, support the show, access some of this fantastic film commentaries and the Agents in the Field series. You can find out more about it in the show notes below or head to patreon.com slash spyhards. Now, Cam, I promised them. Tell them, what are we doing next week? We are tackling the 2016 film Criminal, starring Ryan Reynolds and Kevin Costner. I'm looking forward to tackling this one. It's not one I'm familiar with, but we have a bit of a special treat. We're actually joined to review the film by someone who worked on the film. Uh, Jamie Chambers, uh, actually a friend of mine I've known for many years. He's been in this film and a number of spy films, which we're going to discuss in the episode. It should be a blast. Yeah, I haven't seen Criminal, so I'm looking forward to some insight into this uh, mysterious movie. Well, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out Criminal and join us next week. You can, of course, find out more about The Knock List. The man who knew too much didn't make it, but there's plenty of films that have. And if you want to know some great spy films to check out, head over to letterbox.com slash spyhards and you can find out more. 
Do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But, finally, until next week, listeners. Sir, you have beaten my wife, and she's gone off with another man. You are a dirty dog. 